This is Pennsylvania's moment. This is our time to commit to doing the work, to ending discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and our loved ones here in this state, in this commonwealth, and in securing the freedom to marry that we deserve right here in Pennsylvania. People in Pennsylvania should not have to go to New York or Iowa or California or South Africa or Spain in order to have what we all deserve in the place we call home. And thanks to the case filed by the ACLU, thanks to the extraordinarily tenacious groundwork laid by leaders like Dan Frankel, we have the vehicles in this state to secure the full liberty, the full promise, the full protection we all deserve right here in our home of Pennsylvania. But it's not gonna happen just because we have terrific lawyers who've now brought an important lawsuit. It's not gonna happen just because we know we can count on tenacious advocates like Dan Frankel. It only happens whether in the courts or in the legislature when we commit to doing the door-to-door, -door, neighbor to neighbor, person-to-person -person organizing that creates the climate and the momentum for lawmakers to rise to do the right thing. And of course, you also have to elect the right lawmakers to do the right thing. And it also only happens in the courts when we have the right climate of empowerment and encouragement and emboldening around the courts. And so this is our moment. Many of you have worked hard for many, many years. You've done important community work. You've built organizations, you've networked. You've contributed to the, to the opportunities our movement has had to move forward on other fronts. And it's a national campaign. So when we advance in New York, when we advance in Iowa, when we advance in California, it does move us all forward in all 50 states. And it's important that we look for the strategic opportunities and invest in them and support them no matter where we live. But it's especially sweet when it's the time and the battleground where we are. And this is Pennsylvania's time. So what I really hope today is talk to do is to talk a little bit about what we've all just come through and where we stand and the momentum we have and Freedom to Marry's plans for moving forward. But then I really actually want to open it up to, as Sue said, hopefully the many, many questions and ideas people have here. And I'm really glad Vic and Dan are here because I'm going to invite them to not be shy and to join in the conversation. Because the most important thing we can agree on today is not just that we are celebrating immense and transformative promise, progress, but that we're actually committed to finishing the job here in Pennsylvania. And Freedom to Marry, the national campaign to win marriage nationwide, is thrilled to be partnering and working alongside the ACLU in this commonwealth, as in every other state where we can, to create the climate and do the work, knowing that the key to winning is that we, together, neighbor to neighbor, community by community, have to make the same strong case for the Freedom to Marry, and for equality, and for ending discrimination in the court of public opinion as our advocates are making in the courts of law and in the legislative chamber. So I, I, we don't even really have time if I'm gonna really keep my promise and say we're gonna open up to Q&A and to discussion uh, to talk about the immense gains we've made over the last 15 years or the last 10 years in 2011, and I'm not even right now going to talk about 2012, which was an epic, amazing, heartening year. Let's just talk about 2013. In 2013, we, by focusing around the country on where we have the points of opportunity to move forward in this national campaign, won the freedom to marry, not just in one, not just in two, but in three states already, and we're not even done. And one of those states, Minnesota, in the heartland, is a state where we were knife to our throat a little more than a year ago 
when the anti-gay forces thought that they were going to be the ones to cement yet another discriminatory amendment in their constitution. We organized, we regrouped, people all across the country contributed to support the frontline work of the people then in Minnesota, and we for the first time defeated one of these anti-gay amendments that they've been throwing at us so casually and nastily in a preemptive attack year by year by year, state by state. But we weren't done because we immediately regrouped and went for, this is my last sports metaphor of the day, the double play. We defeated the amendment and we organized the legislative campaign that required the kind of leadership on the ground in the legislature but also the kinds of door-to-door, person-to-person knocking, conversations, engagement that I talked about earlier. We built a campaign in Minnesota, and we won the Freedom to Marry. Three states with the Freedom to Marry already this year, and we're not done. We've won, I'm starting even to lose track, four to five countries this year. We now have the Freedom to Marry on, depending on whether we can count Colombia, which today issued its first marriage license, 18 countries on five continents where same-sex couples can share in the freedom to marry, up from zero little more than a decade ago. This year alone, we've won the freedom to marry in Uruguay, France, New Zealand, Brazil, arguably Colombia, and Britain's on its way. Pretty good work. And then, And there was this matter of the Supreme Court. As you all know, there were two marriage cases making their way into the Supreme Court this year, and we set our goal, starting in last November, December, to A, win more states, and B, generate a tidal wave of stories, of messengers, of conversations, of victories, that would help create a climate around the court to hopefully maximize our chances of winning in the Supreme Court, and to regardless make sure that we were making the case to the country so that no matter what the court did, we would be in a stronger place come July. Well, we all did. A few weeks ago, the Supreme Court handed down decisions in the two cases, and they were epic. The Supreme Court did two major things just a couple weeks ago. First, in the ruling, striking down a core part of the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, the federal discrimination against lawfully married couples, the court turned the federal government from being the number one discriminator against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people and our families, to now putting its moral, and indeed its legal weight on the side of our families, on the side of the Constitution, on the side of the freedom to marry in every state. We have transformed the federal government from being the single biggest problem to now being part of the solution we're all gonna deliver. Huge. But that's not the only thing that happened with that ruling because the immediate impact of the ruling thanks in part to the swift and smooth commitment of the Obama administration to implement that federal rule. I've now been flooded by phone calls and email over the last couple weeks plus from people who have immediately begun feeling the victory that we won by being now able to start accessing the important federal protections and responsibilities triggered by marriage that they had previously been denied. People literally saw their deportation hearings terminated, were able to remain in the country, and now have the family unification standard that every other family is is entitled to as triggered by marriage. Couples have now begun to be able to sponsor together for a green card and remain in the country. People are actually making plans now to return home from the diaspora, the exile in which they've been living because they were no longer able to stay and work in the United States. Hundreds of people have already begun returning home with thousands and tens of thousands affected by this simple ending of a cruel and irrational and 
unfair exclusion. And that's just in the area of immigration. There are 1,138 plus federal protections and responsibilities that this ruling now removes the barrier to and that we are working with strong leadership, I'm very happy to say, from the Obama administration to deliver. And the, the effect of the ruling is, as we now work to implement it, is that legally married couples should be treated by the federal government as what they are, married, even if their state discriminates. What that means in Pennsylvania is, while we continue to have to do the work to end this discrimination in Pennsylvania, the federal government will now begin treating married couples here as the married couples they are for federal programs and purposes. And watch over the next few weeks as we work together with our partners and the leadership of the Obama administration to ascertain and establish that taxation and social security and every other federal protection and responsibility triggered by marriage is now available to couples who are legally married, even if they live in a state that we still have to continue working to end discrimination at the state level. Now, some of these protections may require more than the administration's implementation and may require actual action by Congress, and we're still working on that. And that's why we've now called on Congress again to pass the Respect for Marriage Act, the bill that would fully undo the so-called Defense of Marriage Act and codify this principle that even if states are discriminating, the federal government under the command of the Constitution may not. All of this energy and action and hope and opportunity and real, concrete, tangible protections flowing to people's lives are a product of the work we've all done that set the stage for the immensely important Supreme Court ruling we just won. And that was one of two things the court did. <laughs> see how you see how right tectonic We get earthquake in that way. Okay. Right. Well, let's talk faster then. Okay, so the other big thing the Supreme Court did was to, of course, leave standing the lower court ruling striking down the infamous Proposition 8, the measure in California that stripped away the freedom to marry. And as a result, the, California, the, the freedom to marry was restored in California, and as I'm sure you all saw, marriages have now begun again. People have begun getting married, joyously celebrating, and having the protections and responsibilities in California. And a decision that's been embraced by Californians, and certainly by the elected officials and, um, and the public. So that's important for millions and millions of people. It's important for the you know, tens of thousands of couples and their loved ones and their kids whose lives are now made better without anyone losing anything. But it also means that we have now restored California as another engine state helping move this national campaign forward. And of course, California is a pretty big state. And so what that means is we now have in the United States, nearly a third of the American people, that's nearly 100 million people, living in a state where gay people can marry, up from zero a decade ago. But as we don't have to go too far to remember here in Pennsylvania, that means we have 200 million living in 38, in 37 states where people do not yet have that full liberty and protection that they deserve. And that's why we're here today. We celebrate these victories, immense momentum, and the other good piece of news is the same winning strategy that brought us to these victories is the strategy that is going to bring it home in every state in the country. It is the freedom to marry strategy, it's not a secret, it's on our website. <laughs> it's called the Roadmap to Victory. It draws from the lessons of history as to how America does its civil rights business. And the bottom line of that strategy is the way we are going to win, 
the way we are going to make sure that people in Pennsylvania have the same freedom to marry as people in, pick a state, Minnesota. The way we're going to make sure that couples who are married are respected equally and fully in every corner of this country, whether it be Mississippi, Alabama, or New York, is the strategy on our website that says, Ultimately, we are going to get this nationwide when the Supreme Court takes another marriage case and next time strikes down this discrimination nationwide, not only in California, not only at the federal level. How are we going to make that happen? The strategy tells us. The way we are going to make that happen is to make sure that when the next case gets to the Supreme Court, and no one knows when that's going to be because the Supreme Court gets to decide. They can duck it. They cannot take a case. Cases sometimes resolve themselves early. They sometimes take procedural detours. We don't know whether it's going to be the ACLU's Pennsylvania case or one of the 13 or so other marriage cases that are already pending now and bubbling their way through in courts across the country or whether it's going to be a one after that. We don't know that yet. But what we do know is if we want to win, the way we maximize our chances is to make sure that when the Supreme Court takes the next marriage case, in a matter of years, not decades, that we have done everything we can to assure that we have won a critical mass of states and a critical mass of public support, which together create the climate just as it does for the legislature in Harrisburg, just as it does for the court system here in Pennsylvania, it does for the Supreme Court, that we create the climate that encourages and propels the Supreme Court to bring the country to the right side of history. So the key thing we can do to make sure that we secure this victory nationwide, including here, in years, not decades, is to win more states and grow that majority. Happily, that's the work that also will most quickly bring the freedom to marry here in Pennsylvania. It is the work that advances our community. It's the work that advances our country. And it's the work we have in front of us. Freedom to Marry earlier this week rolled out a very detailed plan calling on everybody to understand the roadmap ahead, which states are the points of opportunity where we can together bring the country forward, and the kind of work that can be done in every state to contribute to this national momentum. Again, it's on our website. Here in Pennsylvania, it's one of the frontline states. It's one of the frontline states because of the work being done, and it's one of the frontline states because this is a state without a constitutional amendment, where if we organize and knock on doors and have those conversations and build support, do the work that we need to do, we can win. And so I'm so happy to be here today because while I want to win in every state, and my work's not done until we've won nationwide, and I, as I keep telling people when they say, well, which state? I love all my children. I want, <laughs> I want us to win everywhere, and we're not done until we've won everywhere, until we've won everything for everyone. But it will be particularly sweet to win in Pennsylvania. So let's do it. Yeah. So, you're the ones that have now been given homework, questions, comments, answers, and really Vic and Dan, please, please don't be shy, please join in because if there are things people can do to really help us move forward on our fronts here, you guys are the leaders and we want to make sure that people know. So, yeah. I have a question that's related to the recent ruling and its impact on people like us who were legally married in another state and live in Pennsylvania. Are we now, how, how are we going to know whether we should file joint taxes next year? Right. How are we going to know right. so, when so, will these things Right, so the question is, how do couples who are legally married but are living in a state that may discriminate, such as Pennsylvania, how do you know how to proceed with regard to the federal respect that you're now due? And the answer is it's a little bit of an evolving piece of work. The Obama administration is working on it. Literally on day one, the president came out publicly and said we are going to move swiftly and smoothly to enforce the command of this constitution and the court. 
We, I direct the Attorney General to conduct a program by program, agency by agency review to, to fully implement. And the Attorney General then convened a group of us, and he's right on it, and they've appointed a task force, and they're moving on it. And they've been rolling out guidance and statements from various agencies as they're adjusting uh, the, the policies and the programs in order to make that available. So one, one way is obviously to just stay, stay on top of it, you know, watch the news, et cetera. A second one way is that, this is another remarkable achievement, actually all the national groups are working very closely and well in the immense amount of work it has taken to tee this up through researching literally 1,100 plus federal programs and responsibilities, the legal standards that apply, and to work and partner with agencies and so on, we've all collaborated on a series of FAQs, you know, frequently asked question documents. We all have them on our website. So if you go to Freedom to Marry, I think it's Freedom to Marry slash after DOMA or something like that. But if you means that you're discriminated against, they may think because they're nice to you, you're fine. But they have not been asked to connect the dots, and you need to have that conversation with them. That's the key conversation. So start with the, the friendly, start with the comfortable, and move your way out. And, and as important as it is to do that personally, the other challenge here is that we create organizations and a campaign that supports the, mil you know, the millions of us doing it. So it's not only about you doing your own part, though you have to do your own part, because that's what it consists of. But we also have to build the team efforts to get more people doing this, including knocking on doors, including going to various salons and opportunities and schools and churches and other places where we can engage people and have this conversation. That is, that is the, the key engine of democratic change. As far as schools, actually I think in many places, contrary to what the way the right wing sometimes presents it, school kids are very aware of what's going on. Kids pay attention. Yeah. Kids have grown up in a world without the same blinders and without the same denial, without the same not wanting to know. And they, they follow this and sometimes they discuss it. Sometimes they discuss it in social studies, sometimes they discuss it in classes, and so on. So to me it's actually not so much about the schools. To me it's really much more about getting the voters and engaging them, which sometimes can be done through a PTA and a conversation about what it means to be able to tell your son that your family is respected and protected, or to have to tell your your son that we love you, and we're sorry that the law doesn't get People in your PTA and school board may need to hear that. When President Obama, in May of last year, came out in support of the Freedom to Marry, it was an extraordinarily important, transformative moment for us that really unleashed a lot of permission on the part of a lot of Americans to change their mind. And it was important for two reasons. It's important because the president showed moral leadership and did something really important that did galvanize national discussion. But what was also important about it, if you go back and now watch the YouTube video of it, is the way in which the president explained how he had changed it. And if you remember, he talked about knowing gay people on his staff, gay friends, watching them parents, watching them be loving and committed and there for one another. He talked about military personnel and how wrong it was for our country to say to people, you're okay to serve our country and defend our country, but we're not going to respect your family while you're away. But most important, he talked about conversations that he and Michelle had with Malia and Sasha, their daughters. And he told how the daughters had said to the President and First Lady that they have classmates of theirs being raised by gay parents. And the girls said, how unfair they saw it, that some families should be treated very differently from others. And the president said, not as a lawyer, not as the president, but as a parent, as a Christian, he said. I had to think about the values Michelle and I are trying to teach our kids. We're trying to teach them the values of the golden rule, treating others as you should be treated, as you want to be treated. And I realized, the president said, as a parent, that if I'm going to be teaching my daughters these values, I have to be consistent with them. And that's why I changed. That explanation was so resonant because it was true to how so many millions of other Americans have changed their minds. And it's where somebody like you, and we all have a version, has an incredibly powerful story to share, but it's only if you have the conversation that people have the opportunity to rise. Do you have a recommendation for how 
straight couples can perhaps, or if you've done any research or anything about what, what some of us can do, because I think we, we, are, we don't have a powerful story, we have a story of a friend, and sometimes it is powerful, but it's, it's more diluted, and so when we have, some of us have conversations with, you know, family members and people that are extremely biased, and I think it's, it's hard, um, it seems like it's hard to make a connection there, so is it going to legislature? I mean, have you looked yeah. into this? Right. So first of all, non-gay people have very important stories to tell, including with even what you just truncated right now. You have friends. You know people. And you have your own personal values of what kind of society, what kind of school, what kind of community you want to have, and why it matters to you. And you also have something that gay people don't always have. You have access to people who can identify with you first, easier than with us. And so in many of the ads that we have run, we haven't had as the narrator or as the central character in the ad a gay couple, even powerful and important as those stories are. We have had those stories, but the narrator, the messenger, the bridge is often a non-gay family member or neighbor who can bring people in that we need to bring in and help make the connection. So non-gay people have an extraordinarily important role and have played an important role in growing this majority and relating those stories and talking about your own values in the same way that the president, though not gay, was able to connect to gay people through the stories he told, but do it as the, the, the non-gay messenger, the non-gay validator, and the non-gay bridge whom people could more easily hear it from. That's an extremely important role, and it's crucial we need it. And the second part of your question was, in, in, in a sense, which is more important, or which should we be doing? Should we be having these personal neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor building support conversations, or should we be contacting the lawmakers? And I'm sure you know what my answer is. Both. <laughs> we need to do both. And partly that's why it's incumbent on the activists, gay or non-gay here, to make sure that while we are charging people with their personal responsibility to do the work we all need to do in our own circles, no one person is going to be the best person to reach people. You're going to be able to reach people that I will never be able to reach. And they'll care more about you than they're going to care about hearing from me, no matter what TV show I may be on. Same with you. You're going to be able to reach people who will care about you and hear about you and be able to hear her story more effectively when you've delivered it first. So the personal peace that we all have in our circles is a crucial contribution to the total that gets us where we need to go. But at the same time, and this is the challenge to the activists, to the organizations, and to all of us to join and be part of organizations, we need to create the collective vehicles, the campaigns, that deliver the tools, that deliver the encouragement, that deliver the support, that hold us accountable for our personal work. We need campaigns and organizations. And we need to then take them personally and the collective and knock on those doors and send those emails and be in the hallways in Harrisburg because that's what they respond to. The key engine of the close the deal campaigns in the legislature, as I'm sure Dan Frank will attest, is not having him stand up and make a speech, but making sure that when he does do that for us, we've also backed him up by visiting our members, walking those halls, sending those emails, having a little laptop with you or on your cell phone to be able to show a picture of your family and make them look you in the eye and hear the story and touch their hearts over and over and over. That's so, you know, really both are essential and that's exactly what the next two, two, three years in Pennsylvania needs to look like. That's how we won in Maine. That's how we won in Minnesota. That's the key to winning. If we want to win in Pennsylvania, that's what we need to do. questions out we could ask them both at the same time and if you respond one's political one's legal legal and discriminatory laws whether enacted by congress such as the so-called defense of marriage act or enacted by a state legislature or enacted by the public in a state in a constitutional amendment all of those are subject to the u.s constitution so the ultimate win is going to come when the supreme court takes a challenge to the denial of marriage, whether it's a denial like Pennsylvania's, that's not in the Constitution, but still is a denial, or a denial like Oregon's, where there's a constitutional amendment that we're working to overturn. But if a case comes up that a couple has been denied and the Supreme Court does what it ultimately needs to do, declare the freedom to marry applies to gay people as to non-gay people, and these 
discriminatory barriers lack any justification. All of those barriers, constitutional, local, state, will come down. Our work is to get ourselves there, not just by filing lawsuits, but by making sure we've done the work of critical mass of states and critical mass of public opinion so that the court does the right thing when it takes the case. Right? And the key arguments are, most importantly, equal protection. There is no good reason for treating gay people differently when it comes to the constitutional freedom to marry than not gay people. And clearly now the evidence shows there is no good reason for denying, and there are important good reasons for, for having it. So that's what's mounting in the country, and equal protection, as in the DOMA ruling, will be one of the core engines. Another possible ruling would turn on the freedom to marry itself. That the freedom to marry is, as the Supreme Court has said at least 14 times, a fundamental freedom that cannot be denied arbitrarily by the government. At this point, it has become abundantly clear that denial is arbitrary. There are other legal arguments that could be made under the Constitution, but those are going to be the two that I think will bring down this discrimination ultimately. As far as African Americans, we have work to do in every community. We have to knock on doors, we have to have those personal conversations, we have to engage neighbor to neighbor, we have to mobilize, and we have to build. The African American community, like the Latino community, like, like the white public, etc., actually has shown tremendous momentum, and particularly momentum over the last year, year and a half. And there's support growing in every part. What we need to do is make sure we have not left anyone out, we engage people, we put the stories forward. Each person is the best messenger to some people. We need to make sure we continue to highlight the massive impact that the denial of the freedom to marry has on African American families. African American gay families and Latino gay families are the most likely to be raising children. They're the most likely to be vulnerable because of the legal and economic deprivations that come from marriage. I mean, this is data that we have that we can show that. We need to make sure people hear that conversation. But we also need to make sure that people hear the kinds of stories that President Obama told. That if we're sitting around our, our kitchen table trying to teach our kids the golden rule and treating others as you want to be treated, whether you're black or white, that's an important value. You can't be true to that value if you're discriminating. That we don't have to agree on everything on, but we can't be writing them off. And just as I was gently pushing back on the notion that just because people are with us, we need to try to find something else to do, we need to have the conversation with everyone. We can't assume they're with us. We have to engage them. We have to give them the tools to rise and do their work. But we also shouldn't be writing off people that we may think may not yet be with us. The story of this, as Dan just said, has been tremendous public shift over the last many years, and particularly accelerating in the last years because more and more and more and more people have been engaged and asked to think about it. That's the opportunity in Pennsylvania. As family members, certainly as parents, we all want the best for all our children and our children are at their best when they're safe and secure with loving parents, loving families, and the law on their side. Second parent adoption, like the freedom to marry, is an important legal protection that means a lot to families, to parents seeking to care for their kids, to kids wanting to know that their family is respected and supported and shored up. And then, of course, there are the legal and economic protections that flow from it. Winning second parent adoption in, in Pennsylvania was enormously important for many, many families. So will be the freedom to marry. We have a lot more to do. Let's go to work.